there are many people who wonder, is Jesus truly the Messiah? Many ask, is there evidence that shows that he is really the Son of God? What you are about to see will show how the Old Testament, which was written hundreds of years before Christ came to the world, described his life in detail. And today, you will see a great mystery revealed. Because in this video, we reveal from the Old Testament the exact year that Jesus was to arrive into the world and die for us. And we will see how history confirms the whole thing. Today we reveal the 70 week prophecy of Daniel. Before we can look at the prophecy of Daniel, we need to first look at who Daniel is. So, after the kingdom of Babylon attacked Jerusalem, it took many Israelites into captivity. And the Israelites who were found to have certain gifts were given special treatment. One of them was Daniel. And he became known as a prophet of God. In the beginning of the book of Daniel, we see his journey to become an instrument of God in this foreign land. And towards the middle and end of the book, we are shown many of the visions that God gave him. One of those visions reveals the exact year that the Messiah would come. So this is going to be a, uh, a good video, and uh, you may have to break out your calculator for this one. So when you look at the uh, book of Daniel, by chapter 9, God has already given Daniel many visions about the future. And Daniel wants to know, when are these things going to start happening? So the angel Gabriel comes into the picture and he lets Daniel know when the Messiah will arrive on the scene. And this is huge because if we can see from the Old Testament when the Messiah was to come, well, then it should settle all arguments about if Jesus was the Messiah or not. I mean, if you can look and see from the Old Testament where it says the Messiah should come at this date, well, we can look and see what happened in the future and if Jesus fulfilled it. So what you are about to see in this video is so important and let's go ahead and get into it. So the angel comes to Daniel and he gives him a time frame of 70 weeks until the Messiah comes and the visions are fulfilled. And in chapter 9, verse 24, this is what the angel tells Daniel. 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your city to finish transgression and put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy. So, the angel comes to Daniel and he gives him a 70 week time frame until these visions that he's been seeing start happening. And in verse 25, he is going to let Daniel know when the Messiah will come. Verse 25, know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So he says that after there has been a decree to rebuild Jerusalem, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. So basically, he says um, there will be 7 plus 62, which is a total of 69 weeks after the decree is made that the anointed one uh, will come on the scene. So first of all, who is the anointed one, the ruler here that it says is going to come? Well, most commentaries agree that the anointed ruler that Daniel mentions here is the same person he was referring to in his previous vision in chapter 7. In the earlier vision, Daniel refers to this individual called the Son of Man, who will be given the greatest kingdom of all. And so it makes sense here that this anointed ruler who will come is the same person that Daniel was referring to in his previous vision, the Son of Man, the Messiah. And so let's look and see who is this anointed one. It says, rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. Well, 
if you click where it says tools and look at the original Hebrew word, you will find it says rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince. So the word that was translated from Hebrew into the word anointed one is actually from the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah. And as you can see here, um, the word Mashiach often refers to anointed or Messiah is often translated as the uh, anointed one, the Messiah, the Messianic Prince, the King of Israel, the High Priest of Israel. So it's pretty clear here that when it says the anointed one, it's referring to the original he Hebrew word, the Mashiach or the Messiah. So when he says that this anointed ruler is going to come, he says this is when the Messiah is going to come and arrive into the picture on the scene. And so let's look at the time frame that Daniel is given until the arrival of the Messiah. So the angel said from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah comes, there will be a time frame of seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is a total of 69 weeks. So after that decree is made, 69 weeks later, the Messiah should be on the scene. So if we're going to see if Daniel was accurate about the coming of the Messiah, the first thing we have to do here is find out when there was a decree that was made to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Because if we can find out that, then we have a starting point. Well, thank God for documented history. <laughs> because from commentaries and archeological findings, we know that there were four decrees that were made by three different kings to rebuild the temple. And from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we find that the decree that Daniel is referring to here most fits the time frame of the third king, Artaxerxes I of Persia. And the date that he made a decree to rebuild their temple was in 457 BC. So the prophecy said that after the king issues a decree, which happened in 457 BC, there would be 69 weeks until the Messiah comes. Well, uh, break out your calculator, do the math. 69 weeks. How many days is 69 weeks? 483 days. So according to this Old Testament prophecy, if we start from 457 BC and add 483 days to that, we should arrive at when the Messiah was here on the scene. <laughs> well, if there's anything that we've seen from the last two videos, it's that whenever the Old Testament deals with prophecy and numbers like this, if you want to see how it was fulfilled, you have to use the prophetic code. In the book of Jonah, we saw how the code was one day equals one year. And that showed us how the Jonah prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when Jerusalem fell. In the last video about the Hosea prophecy, we saw how the code was one day equals one millennium. And that revealed exactly when the nation of Israel would be revived. And so since Daniel here, um, and this prophecy is also dealing with days and numbers. We already know that there's going to be a code involved. So the question is, which code do you use? Well, just like the other codes, you can't just plug in some unknown uh, random multiplication and hope that you land on something that happened in history. You have to use the codes that the Bible provides. And what we see is that the code that fits here is the same one for the Jonah prophecy, the day to year code. <laughs> uh, so here are a few scriptures that refer to this code. Ezekiel 4, 6, it says, I have assigned to you 40 days, a day for each year. And also Numbers 14, 34, it reads, for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explore the land, you will suffer for your sins. So here we have a couple of examples of how often with prophecy, the number of days that it mentions really points to the number of years that something will happen in the future. So all we have to do here 
is apply the day to year code in this prophecy just like we did with the Jonah prophecy. And so if we start at 457 BC, instead of adding 483 days into the future, if we change that to 483 years, that brings us to 27 AD. Now, if you do the counting, you would land on 26, but here's the thing with BC and AD, zero isn't actually a year, so you don't count zero. So if you count from 457, 483 calendar years into the future will bring you to 27 AD. So let's see what happened in 27 AD. And so I'm using here the Bible Hub chronology site. And I love this site because it has gathered the chronology and dates from many of the top historians and academic sources. And they have placed them all here for us to have and see. And so this is a, an amazing resource. And so when we scroll down to 27 AD, well, look at where we land. Wow. That's when he began his ministry. <laughs> in 26 AD, we have him being baptized. And after he was baptized, it says that he was full of the Holy Spirit, which led him to the wilderness. And he was uh, tempted in 27 AD. And then right after that, he called his first disciples in 27 AD. <laughs> That's why Daniel was told that it would be 483 years until the coming of the Messiah, when he will be on the scene doing the work of the kingdom. <laughs> wow. This is amazing because here from the Old Testament, we are given the exact time frame for when Jesus would arrive on the scene in 27 AD. Now, the reason this is such a big deal is because this was this is in the Old Testament and archaeological evidence, the Dead Sea Scrolls and many others proves that this was written hundreds of years before Jesus came to the world, before the incarnation took place. And so this is pivotal because it means that now we have something here that clearly shows the world that Jesus is the Messiah. And guess what else? History shows that in 408 BC, Jerusalem was finally rebuilt, which is another fulfillment of prophecy because 408 BC is exactly 49 years after 457 BC, which would be seven prophetic weeks, seven times seven, seven days, 49 years, just as the angel said. And then after that, you have Jesus coming into the scene around 27 AD. <laughs> now here's the thing. When Jesus came onto the scene around 27 AD, he didn't arrive the way many expected the Messiah to come. You see, just like how you and I study prophecy today, there were many Jewish sects and groups at the time that studied prophecy in detail. And so they knew about the Daniel prophecy and they were expecting around 27 AD that the Messiah would come. However, they thought that the Messiah would come in his kingly glory. They thought that his first coming would be when he would overthrow every human government and set up his throne in Jerusalem. And so, as you could imagine, many groups who were expecting the Messiah to come were, were disappointed. One of those groups were the Essenes. They figured, hey, if the Messiah is going to be here around 27 AD, we might as well get far away from the Roman Empire because the Messiah is going to come here. He's going to destroy it. He's going to destroy every government and um, he's going to be ruling from his throne. So we might as well just camp out here in the middle of nowhere and form our own community and just uh, wait until the Messiah comes. And that's what they did. They went into the mountains and they, and they took all of their scrolls with them and they waited, they waited. And sadly, 
the Messiah didn't come the way they expected. But you see, while they were near the Dead Sea, in caves awaiting for the Messiah to come to bring this physical kingdom, the Messiah, Jesus was here, but he was bringing the kingdom, not, not physically, but spiritually through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh man. Now, when Jesus returns at the second coming, he will bring the kingdom uh, physically. He will set up his throne in Jerusalem, just like the messianic prophecies foretold. I mean, all the, all the things the Old Testament spoke about Messiah, they have to be fulfilled. And so at the second coming, you will see all of that. He will reign on the earth in his kingly glory. It's gonna be amazing. The great thing is that we will be there and be a part of it. And so we will do a video explaining why didn't Jesus physically set up his throne the first time he came? Why did he have to come here and die first? And then he is going to come again to do all that. Why didn't he just do it the first time? Well, there's an important answer to that. And so that video, it will come and it's going to be a good one. So this Daniel prophecy, it's not over yet. Because remember, the angel gave Daniel a 70 week time frame until this prophecy is complete. And so what we've been looking at here is just the 69 week portion of the prophecy. And we saw how during this part of it, um, the Messiah Jesus came onto the scene and he began his ministry. So what happens in the final week of the prophecy? What was foretold? Well, let's see what the angel says about the final seven days or seven years of the prophecy. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. What we've been looking at so far is 25, which is the first 69 weeks of the prophecy. And verses 26 and 27 explain the final week. After 62 sevens or weeks. So this right here is going to talk about the final week. After 62 weeks have been completed, um... You know, this is moving into the last week. He says the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death and will have nothing. <laughs> now, this is amazing because before it talked about how the anointed one would come. And then it says right here that the, that the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death. So I don't know how anyone can be surprised that Jesus had to die when it says right here, the Messiah will be put to death. <laughs> But notice this, it says that he will have nothing. Now, the original Hebrew language actually can be translated another way as well. Look at the footnote. Or it can read, the anointed one will be put to death, but not for himself. Wow. So if you read it that way from the original Hebrew, that's saying the anointed one will be put to death but not for himself. <laughs> Why would it say that? Because Jesus didn't die for himself. <laughs> he died for you. <laughs> and that's why um, if you look at the King James version of this, um, it just uh, translates it from the original Hebrew this way. It just says uh, the Messiah will be cut off but not for himself. So it just says not for himself. And so, you know, again, it's just amazing because it shows here that after 27 AD, the Messiah will come and then he will die. <laughs> All right, so let's keep reading. <laughs> the people of the ruler who will come, well, who is the ruler? Well, we've already established that that anointed ruler is the Messiah. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who are the people of the ruler? Who are the Messiah's people? <laughs> well, he's called the king of the Jews, the, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites. Now, of course, you know, we know that through Christ, we are all his people, no matter, you know, whether you're Jew or Gentile, no matter your race, anything like that. But in this context, the people of the ruler who will come is referring to the Israelites with Jewish people. And so it says that the Jewish people will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, how are they going to do that? How could the Israelite or Jewish people have destroyed their own city in the sanctuary? Well, let's keep reading. 
The end will come like a flood. War will continue to the end and desolations have been decreed. Now, let me just say this. Before we can answer the question of how did the Jewish people, the people of the Messiah, destroy the city and the sanctuary, we have to first just um, cover something. So verse 26 here, this is all a summary of what takes place in the final week of the 70 week prophecy. Okay, verse 27 is going to break down when the Messiah will be killed and how his people destroyed the city. So let's read. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, or as you can see, seven here also is translated as weak. So who is he? Well, we're still talking about the Messiah, the anointed one, the ruler. So the Messiah will confirm a covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple or the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, this is critical. It says, until the end that is decreed is poured out on, and what can this also be translated from Hebrew as? It. So if that is the case, it could be translated as this, upon the wing of the abominable temple, until the end that is decreed is poured out on the city. And so this can read that the Messiah is coming and there will be this abomination that is set up that causes desolation until the end is poured out on the city. The city. So here's the thing. Verse 26 says that the people of the ruler who will come, who are his people, the Jewish people, it says that they will destroy the city. And how will they destroy the city? Well, as it says right here, um, there will be an abomination that is set up until destruction is poured out on what? The city. And when that is set up, their city will become desolate. So what did they do? How did they do it? By setting up the abomination. So now the question becomes, what is the abomination that was set up? What is the abomination that caused the destruction of their city and the desolation of it? Well, look at this. Deuteronomy 21, 23. You must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight, but be sure to bury it the same day. Because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Here it says that if a person's body is left hanging on a pole, it is a curse. And if that curse happens, the land will be desecrated. You see, the people of God were given Israel. They were given Jerusalem as an inheritance, as a, as a land. And so, if they committed this curse, what would happen? They would lose it. So, did they commit the curse? Hmm. Look at what it says in Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He says that when Christ was hung on that cross, that became a curse. And what did Deuteronomy say would happen if the people of God committed that curse? Their land would be defiled. My friends, when they crucified Jesus on that pole, on that cross, they committed the abomination that caused desolation. And that's what happened. We saw from Hosea and Zechariah in the last video, and Jonah, that if the people of God killed the Messiah, 
they would be scattered and that their land would become desolate. And that's exactly what happened in 70 AD after the crucifixion when the Romans came and destroyed their temple and scattered them to all nations. And so that's why here in verse 26, it says that the people of the ruler, his own people, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. How will they do that? By setting up the abomination, which will cause the desolation. And what is the greatest abomination you could commit? To crucify the Son of God. But also, notice what it says here in verse 27. It says that he, the Messiah, will also set up the abomination of desolation. So it says that the Messiah, not only his people, but also he himself will set up this abomination of desolation. Well, why? Because like Paul said, he willfully became the curse. His life wasn't taken. He gave his life. He decided to become the curse for us so that we could live. Now, we're not done yet because this prophecy it gets even deeper. It actually will tell you the exact timing of when the Messiah would be crucified. So, so remember, verse 26 and 27 are all about the last final week or the final seven days of the prophecy. And look what it says here. It says that in the middle of the week, the Messiah will put an end to sacrifice and offering. In the middle of that last week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So he came on the scene in 27 AD, and in the middle of seven years, what is that? 3.5. Why does it say that in the middle he will put an end to sacrifice and offering? <laughs> well, what happened when Jesus was killed? Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, it explains that when Jesus offered his life for this world, his body became the final sacrifice. And this is why when he died, with his body being the final sacrifice for our sins, that put an end to sacrifices and offerings. And the thing is, it says that in the middle of the week. Now, why does it say that? Well, there's a seven year period after 27 AD. Seven divided by two, 3.5. So in the middle of, se of that seven year period, we should see when his crucifixion took place, when there was an end to sacrifices and offerings. So remember, uh, he came on the scene at the very beginning of 27 AD. And so if you count three and a half years past, that puts you right in the middle on 30 AD. So the question becomes, what happened in 30 AD? The crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus was crucified exactly three and a half years after the Old Testament said he would come on the scene at the beginning of 27 AD. He was crucified in 30 AD, the exact time frame that they said he would die, be cut off to end sacrifices and offerings. It's all there. It's, I mean, hey, that's it. it. I can't make this stuff up. I'm not that smart. <laughs> um, but God's word is, <laughs> oh my gosh. So I'm gonna say it again. This shows that the Messiah, the anointed one would arrive on the scene and in the middle of the last week or seven year period, he would die, which would cause the desolation of the city of his people. That would be the abomination that would cause the desolation. Now here's the thing, history shows us that exactly 40 years after 30 AD, their temple, Jerusalem, was destroyed in 70 
AD. And after that, their temple became desolate, Jerusalem became desolate, and they were scattered to the nations. And if you want to see how the Bible actually also predicted that it would be exactly 40 years between when Jesus was crucified to when it would be destroyed, be sure to see our video evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. And so this is really groundbreaking here because the Old Testament said not only would Jesus come on the scene at a certain year and it said that he would die at a certain year, but then the Old Testament said that after that happens, their city would be destroyed. And history shows that after the time period, which was set in the Old Testament, their city was destroyed in 70 AD. How could anybody say that prophecy is not real? Anybody who gets this Anybody who with an open mind is sitting down to learn, to just understand and gets it, this has got to be a life changing thing. Because now you have something in your arsenal, you have a tool, I would say the ultimate apologetic tool to show the world that the Bible is too deep for just a couple of random people to have written its prophecy. So if Jesus knew that his death would be the abomination that would one day cause Jerusalem to fall? Wouldn't he warn the people? Wouldn't he let them know? Well, look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. So here Jesus was talking to his followers about the fall of Jerusalem and the approaching destruction of its temple. And he's going to give them a warning here in verse 15. Watch this. And so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea should flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. He's telling them, when this abomination happens, when, when, when you see standing in the holy place, that abomination, my death, you better get out of Jerusalem. You better flee Judea because it's destruction, it's on the way. And that's exactly what happened. Because in 70 AD, after his death on the cross, many of those who were still left in Jerusalem, many Jews, were killed, taken into captivity, their temple destroyed, just as Jesus warned them. Now, Matthew chapter 24 is interesting because within that chapter, Jesus also talks about the second coming. And so some prophecy teachers mention how what Jesus was referring to here was not only about 70 AD and the abomination of his crucifixion, but also might be a prophetic parallel of what will happen in the future when the Antichrist comes and sets up an abomination. You see, in Daniel chapter 11, it mentions that there will be an abomination that is also set up by a king. And Paul also alludes to this in 2 Thessalonians when he talks about how the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness will come and proclaim himself to be God. And so this is why many people believe that the final week or final seven year period of the Daniel prophecy is not only about what happened in the past with Jesus, but it's also a parallel of a future seven year period of tribulation to come. So there is more to this prophecy and we will have a video on that and we'll see what God reveals. But from this alone, <laughs> we've seen so much. Daniel chapter nine reveals when the Messiah will come, when he will be killed and what would happen to the city of his people after he was killed. It's truly amazing. My friends, this is so big. Because if anyone, Christian or not, with an open mind sits down and hears this and gets it, I don't see how they could not conclude that Jesus is exactly who he is. And at the very least, they could at least conclude that this is some supernatural stuff here. The Old Testament foretold his entire life. 
So I'm asking you to help share this video. We are all ambassadors of Christ. We all work for the King. If you're a part of a Facebook group, share it. Share the video there. Copy the link and share it with a friend in text messages. Share it with someone in your church. And if there's someone that you know who still isn't sold on Jesus, let them see this. Let them see. The book of Daniel in chapter 12, verse 4 says that the meaning of his prophecies would not be truly understood until the end times. And God is allowing us to see and understand things like this. Why? Because he wants us to be ready. He wants us to have full confidence in who he is. Because there is something coming into the world that will greatly test the faith of people. And God wants for the faith of his children to be rock solid. And nothing builds faith 